Right, the first reading is from Genesis 3, verses 17 to 19. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. The second reading is John 3, verses 16 to 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's only begotten Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Okay, fabulous. Thank you very much. Well, it's kind of, I feel like it's the beginning of the summer, isn't it? Yeah? Yeah. I always think you get into April, you can certainly get to Easter, and it's kind of like the doors open, and before you stretches the summer, and I'm really looking forward to our first summer, me and Adele here with you in Penzance, in the West Cornwall circuit, in fact. You'll hear me as we go through, tell you all these stories about stuff that's happened to me in the past, and um, if... uh, It's just because it helps with sermon illustrations. So I'm going to take you back to Dorset. We used to live in Dorset for 10 years. And if you've ever been to East Dorset there, you may know that there's there's a chain ferry. And it runs between Studland and Poole Harbour, if you've ever been there. And uh, so it's on chains. And you, you can drive your car onto this chain ferry. In fact, they can drive a bus onto it. It's big enough. You get on it. It only takes you about five, ten minutes max to sort of winch itself over to the other bank. So you've just about got time to get all parked in, turn off your engine. If, if you're sharpish, you can get out of the car, get up onto the deck, have a look around. It's beautiful around there. Before you have to get back in your car because the ramp's going out the other end and you're driving off. And we were, we were there in the height of summer one time, going across to Studland, which is, of course, very beautiful in our car. And as we parked up, there was like one of the guys who were like working on the boats. So they closed the gates, you know, and off it goes, and they opened the gates. And he was wearing a T-shirt, this fella, that he clearly had made up himself. And it had in great big letters on the front and on the back, there are no toilets on this boat. <laughs> and I thought, that's, if I was having a T-shirt made up, I don't think I'd choose that, you know. And me and Adele sort of thought, why has he had that done? And then it dawned on us, that is the question that he gets asked every every hour of every day of his working life. Are there any toilets on this boat, mate? No, no, there aren't, no. You're not on it for long enough. All right, just hold it in. (laughs) I'm sick of answering the question. I'll just have a T-shirt made up. All right, so the question is, and it it just made me think in the 10 minutes that I had going across the, the estuary, whatever, And I think, as Christians, what are the questions that you get asked by people who aren't Christians? You know what I mean? So someone finds out you're a Christian. You're a Christian, aren't you? And you go, yeah. What's the next question they ask? Can we we just find out by asking you? I mean, can anybody tell me? What's the question that most non-Christians ask? Yes, go on. Is that that's what they ask you, is it? Do you drink alcohol? <laughs> because you look like you do, or <laughs> sorry. 
Okay, that's a good one. What else? What's the question? Do you believe in God? That's a very good question to ask somebody, yeah. Anybody else? What's the... When people find out you're a Christian, what do they want to know? Oh, what do you think? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Is, is that true? Do you know, I think that's the one more than any other, isn't it? Yeah? But, I mean, while we're on it, any, anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Who created God? That's a classroom favourite. Yeah. The answer is, of course, no one. And they go, Ugh. and you go, no, really, no one. Yeah. It's got to stop somewhere, hasn't it? Who created God? Super God. God's dad. Who created God's dad? God's granddad. You know, how far back do you go? It's got to start somewhere. There's got to be a point of origin. Yeah. And that's another sermon. I'll do that in due course. But you're right, the, the really, I mean, there's probably about six questions, the, the really big questions, that when people, you encounter people who aren't Christians, and they'll go, ah, what about this, you know? Uh, and I thought to myself, if I had a t-shirt made up, what would be on that t-shirt? Well, I have had a t-shirt made up. I'm going to take this microphone off, I'll go back behind the legs. I mean, it, it is very hot in here today, isn't it? It actually is, though, isn't it? I mean, for once, the church is warm. Yeah. All winter we've been freezing. But I thought, I'll just... If you're listening to this on the podcast from the Chapel Street website, the, the minister is doing a strip, actually. As, <laughs> but take his glasses out of his pocket. That's it. There's the T-shirt. I, this was actually made up for me by our youth worker at one of my former churches. And this is the... I'll put this back on now. If I can, it doesn't clip very well to a T-shirt, does it? You won't be able to read the legend very well. Oh, excuse me. There we go. If you are listening at home, or if your eyes aren't very good and you're sat here in church, it says basically, free will, mate. That is the answer to the question. So the guy on the boat, there are no toilets on this boat, was the answer to the big question he got asked all the time. The biggest question I get asked, and by the sound of it, some of you get asked as well, if there's a loving God, why is there so much suffering in the world? Answer, free will, mate. Now, the the trouble with the really big questions that people ask you about Christianity is they're very easy to ask. They're they're only a few words long. But if you're going to answer them properly, it's going to take you a while. So if somebody says, why why is there so much suffering in the world then, Ralph? I'll say, sit down a minute. (laughs) Let's talk about this. Have you got 30 minutes? And even then, we could keep talking for hours about this because it's a very tricky question. And I thought it'd be good to address this today just in the light of all the stuff that's happening in the world. I mean, particularly, obviously, the, the war in Ukraine. What the heck is going on? Why is it that people want to kill people? want to bomb people, want to blow people up, want to smash up their country. Why does one country want to invade another country? What is it about Mr. Putin, we might as well go there, that gives him this attitude? Is what he is doing a good and loving thing? Of course it isn't. It's an evil thing. How come this is happening? And that's the tip of the iceberg. In every country of the world, every day, people are doing awful things to each other. And if they're not doing awful things, they're thinking awful things. All right? What about the MP in the week who got caught on his phone with, you know, what's he thinking of? I mean, really? And some of us who kind of look at that sort of, you know, episode in the House of Commons, we think, that's absolutely shameful. But if you canvass the entire population of Penzance, some of, some of the fellows would go, well, you know, fair enough. You know, I've had that temptation as well. I mean, I wouldn't have got my phone out in the House of Commons when I was sat next to a female MP, fair play. But on, on, in the comfort of my own home with nobody else around, it would be a very different matter. Everyone is subject to temptation. However holy we might think ourselves to be, how much in control of our lives we might consider ourselves to be, all of us are subject to temptation. And sometimes we give in. And with the best will in the world, all of you lovely Christian people that I sort of serve here in the West Cornwall circuit, I've been to some church councils, not at this church, where sometimes where you raise a slightly contentious issue and everybody starts getting really cross. And you think, are you lot actually Christians or not? Because what, what's going on here then? You know, you're just the same as everybody else. 
The idea of being a Christian is that you allow the Lord to change you over a period of time. As we walk along life's road together, transform us into something that's a mixture of good and evil. So we're capable of doing good stuff, capable of doing bad stuff, into somebody who is still subject to temptation, but more and more and more is consumed by the power of love from God, getting us ready for the day when we leave this life and meet him face to face. But make no mistake, all of us have got the potential for evil. Why is there so much suffering in the world? Because there are people in the world, is the short answer to that question. And all of us are subject to good and evil. Every film plot it's kind of like the battle between good and Star Wars. It's just all about the battle between good and evil, isn't it? Light and darkness. Harry Potter. Some Christians aren't fond of the idea of Harry Potter, full stop. But if you actually read the books, it's about light versus darkness, love versus evil. It's that same standard thing. It's something that's hardwired into our brain. As we go through life, we're subject to both of these forces, good and evil. And we've got to try and make the best of it. Praise God, we're not alone. That's the point. If you don't believe in God, if you're an atheist, and I, I respect atheists because they've thought about whether there might be a God or not, and they've come to the conclusion that there can't be. But the trouble is then you're on your own. So if you're tempted to do evil, you might give in to it, and there's no one really to help you. You might say, well, you don't have to be a Christian to do good stuff. You might say, oh, well, I know people. They're not Christians at all. They're wonderful Wonderful people, they do tons of things that they never think of themselves. They do wonderful things for other people. And I say, yeah, imagine how cool they would be if they did believe in Jesus. They'd be like Mother Teresa then, wouldn't they? Yeah? We can always improve upon our situation. Why do we want to face this world alone? But I'm saying all of this, and you're still thinking, that's a very pat answer though, Ralph. Free will, mate. Why is it so much evil in the world? Free will. Well, is that really the answer? Yeah. And that's why we had that reading from uh, Genesis 3 this morning. Okay. Any chance you can get it back on the screen there, Rob? That would be ace. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've asked him to do something that I didn't prepare him for. But uh, don't worry if you can't. In Genesis 3, it's the Adam and Eve story, isn't it? And it's the end of the Adam and Eve story that we were looking at. Oh, don't worry about it, mate. It's fine. Um, where like Adam and Eve have eaten the fruit from the forbidden tree and they have discovered that they have a choice. It's really important, this, right at the beginning of the Bible. God says, look, here you are, I've created you. I'm really fond of you. I love you to bits. Just keep the rules. Do as I say and everything will be brilliant. It's a bit like when you have a small child, isn't it? And you say, do what mummy says, do what daddy says. Everything will be fine. And they trust you for a while until they discover that they have a choice. And this came very early in the history of humanity. We discovered we had a choice. We could choose to do the right thing or the wrong thing. And most of us, unless we are unwell, do know the difference, by and large, between the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. We know the difference between light and darkness, between good and evil. This is the first example of people discovering that choice. And God comes to them and says, oh, I knew you were going to do this. This doesn't come as a surprise to God. I knew you were going to do this. You've discovered that there are choices in the world. And to Adam, to the first human beings, he says, look, because you did this, because you've you've allowed evil to come into the world, because before you didn't have a choice, so there was only love. But now you know you've got a choice. Something else has entered the world. I always knew it would. But it's important that it has. Because of that, cursed is the ground because of you. So it's not just humanity who come under this curse of sin. It's the whole planet. Another big question that I get asked is, okay, they say, free will, yeah, we, we can choose between good and evil. Sometimes we choose good, sometimes we choose evil. But what, are like, what about like tsunamis and volcanoes and natural disasters? They're nothing to do with people, are they? Well, in fact, a lot of the real damage that those things do happen in places where they're not prepared for it, either because they can't prepare for it, because they're not economically uh, able. You know, I mean, an earthquake hits uh, in Tokyo, it's a very different outcome to if an earthquake hits in, like, India or somewhere like that, you know what I'm saying? 
But even so, they're natural disasters. So why is, why is that happening? Because cursed is the ground because of humanity's sin. It doesn't stop with humanity. It goes right the way through the whole created order, through the whole of nature, into the earth's crust itself. We live in a dangerous world. And the reason we live in a dangerous world with a God of love in charge of it is because he knew how vitally important it was for us to discover what love is. And in order for us to know what love is, we have to know the alternative. We have to know what hate is. And we have to be able to choose. Because you cannot force somebody to love you. And God knew the price that he was going to have to pay himself to give us that choice. In order for us to have love, evil would have to enter the world. Some people say, did God create evil? No, he didn't create evil, but he created the possibility for evil. We brought evil into the world, and it's been here ever since. Will it ever leave this world? No. The only time that we will be free of the force of evil is when we leave this world. Cursed is the ground because of you. If we can have the next bit, uh, please, Rob. You see what the the consequence of free will is. You're going to have to farm the land really hard, says God. You're going to have to plant and you're going to have to harvest and you're going to have to deal with the vagaries of the weather. And through your toil, you will eat of the land. You'll plant all this stuff and it will produce crops for you, good things, but it will also produce thorns and thistles. This is a really important verse. In our lives, when we give our lives to Jesus, sometimes we give our lives to Jesus and then some way along the line, something bad might happen to us. We might get ill. Somebody we love might get ill. And we say, oh, I didn't expect this. I thought if I gave my life to Jesus, everything would be brilliant. No, that's not what he said. He said, throughout your life, life will continue to be hard and there will be thorns and thistles in your field along with the stuff that you want to eat, the stuff that is good. But you don't have to face it alone. I will be with you. I will never leave you nor desert you. And I think the next bit, if we can go on a little bit further. Yeah, look, it's going to cost you. You're going to get tired of living. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food. Until you return to the ground, from it you were taken. For dust you are, dust you will return. In my job, as you can imagine, I do a lot of funerals. I've got a lot of funerals on at the minute. And hundreds of times I've stood by the graveside. And the coffin's been there, and I've intoned the words of the committal. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I've thrown a bit of soil in, you know, like you do. And when you look at it like that, we come from nothing. We return to the earth, to dust, to nothing. And if there's no God, what is the point? What is the plan? What is the purpose? I was talking to Steve just before we started the the service today. He drew my attention to the scripture that's on your notice sheet today, that really well-known scripture from Jeremiah 29. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I've lived under that promise for many years as God has spoken it over me and over you. Yeah, He has a plan. He has a purpose. But without him... If we don't want his plan and purpose, if we turn away, then we are dust. We came from nothing, and to dust, to nothing, we will return. Whoa. Well, at least he's nailing it down pretty clear early on in the Bible, isn't he? We ignore those first few chapters of Genesis at our peril, because it sets the stage for the whole of human history. And then you carry on reading the Old Testament, and you see the people of Israel, God's chosen people. He says, look, just obey the rules. Just do what I ask you to do and everything will be great. And they don't and everything isn't great. And all through history, at the very point of the creation of the entire universe, God knew that he he wanted us to know love. The only species in the universe that knows love, humans. And he knew the price he'd have to pay. And that we would have to pay that price himself. So if we can turn to John's Gospel, the other reading, chapter 3. We can see, well, to start with, the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. If if I ever wanted to break into any of your computers, I know what your password is. It's usually something like that. Christians, uh, it's usually 316, yeah, or 4316, because, uh, you know, John's Gospel, Fourth Gospel, sorry if I've just uncovered your secret to the world. Go home and change your password. 
All right? By the way, that's not the code to turn off the burglar alarm in Chapel Street Church, all right? Just in case you've got no ideas. God so loved the world, said Jesus. He loves the world. He doesn't hate the world. He hasn't put evil in the world to punish us. He doesn't want us to be punished. He doesn't want us to go back to dust. He wants a glorious inheritance for us. But he's given us free will to choose between good and evil. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him, there's a choice involved. We've got to believe in Jesus. We can know that we're not going to die. We're going to have eternal life. We'll leave this world, but we'll just go on into the next. The next bit says... I haven't come to condemn you, says God. And people, people, I get this all the time. People say, oh, no, Jesus doesn't want me, Ralph. I say, yes, he does. He gave his life for you. No, he doesn't want me. Why not? There's stuff I've done. Particularly blokes say this to me. Ah, there's stuff I've done, Ralph. I'm not proud of it. I say, there's stuff I've done as well. I'm not proud of it. But Jesus came and forgave me. I had to give my life to him. I had to choose But that's what's happened. He hasn't come to judge. He's come to save. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Next bit, please. But whoever doesn't believe, you stand condemned already because of the curse. Okay? So it's not just going to be done for you. Some people think, well, if there's a God and if he loves me, then when it comes to it, no matter what I've done in life, you'll still love me and I'll be all right. That may be true because mercy triumphs over judgment. But you cannot rely on it. Far better to have blessed assurance that you know where you're going and you know that Jesus is yours rather than it being like a game of poker. I'll play me best hand and I'll hope for the best. This is the verdict, said Jesus, when he was talking to Nicodemus. Light has come into the world. If I could have the next bit, please, Rob. Light has come into the world. But people preferred the darkness because when you've sinned, when you've done stuff or even thought stuff that isn't good, that's where you go and hide. You don't hide out in the light, which lights you up and all is revealed. When there are like political scandals and all this caper, which there always are, aren't there? And we've got local elections coming this week, so you watch in the next few days, there'll be all sorts of political scandals being pulled out of nowhere. Stuff that people have done to discredit them brought out of the darkness, out of the little dark corners, into the light where everyone can see it. We're terrified of this stuff. We don't want people to find out about the stuff we've done in life, our former lives, the mistakes we've made along the way. So we prefer the darkness. We hide away in the darkness. Everyone who does evil, said Jesus, hates the light. What's the next bit? And they won't come into the light. You know when you're trying to talk to your friends, maybe family members about Jesus, and they go, oh, I don't want all your religion stuff. I know it means a lot to you, but I don't want it, thank you. They want to stay in the darkness. They don't want to come into the light. Because if you come into the light, everything is seen. Everything is disclosed. I don't like secrets. You know, like somebody comes up to you and says, can I say something to you in confidence? And I'll say, it depends. Depends what it is you want to tell me. It might be something I have to share with somebody else. I much prefer it if we all know everything. But we don't want everybody to know everything about us because we're embarrassed about ourselves. How do we get out of this situation? Only through handing it all to Jesus. And make no mistake, Jesus knows everything that you and I have ever done or thought or said that we regret. Every, every act good, or that one's going to be a preacher one day, isn't it? <laughs> every good thing, every bad thing we've ever done or thought or said. He knows about it. You can't hide anything from him. So it not it just better to say, okay, Lord, I know I've screwed up. Will you forgive me? And he goes, yes! That's the whole point. I can forgive you. Do you choose to be forgiven? And I go, Yeah. But not everybody does. Some people don't want to be forgiven. They've got this bitterness. You don't want to be showing up at heaven's gate with a suitcase full of sin. Because God will just say, you can't come in here with that, mate. Oh, it's my suitcase. It's got my stuff in it. Yeah, but none of that stuff belongs in here. It's bad stuff. Just leave it there and come in. We're very loath sometimes to put these things down. Isn't it weird? We have all these phrases, oh, it's just me, that's just the way I am. Like it or lump it. Fair enough. But if you really want to be happy, 
even when things are really tough, even when things are really dark in your life, if you want to have an inner peace that can get you through it, you can't get it anywhere except through Jesus. That's the only place. Whoever lives by the light, by the truth, comes into the light. We are people of the light, Christians. We want to live in the light. We want to stand strong. And when we get tempted to talk to Jesus about it, isn't it great to have a friend like that? That when things get tough, when you get tempted, when your free will starts to kick in, when your humanity starts to take over, and you think, ah, I can't be bothered. To have Jesus to rely on. He's my strength. Not me. Not you. It's Jesus. All about Jesus. When we lose our grip on Jesus, we've had it. We're in the darkness. This isn't a church anymore if we lose our grip on Jesus. It's It's a weird club. But with Jesus, woo, we're the people of the light. And we're living and walking in the light. One final story. It's like, you know, some people, well, they say, it's all very well, all this Christianity stuff, Ralph, but I, I'm just a normal person. I'm just going to, like, walk the path of life. I know there's a force of evil. It acts on my life. I know there's a, there's a force of good in the world, you know. But I'm just going to walk a straight path. It's going to be fine. It doesn't work that way doesn't work that way. The problem is we are human. And so, as we learned with the Adam and Eve story, the ground has even been cursed because of us. And our burden in life has been increased because of our humanity. And you can't walk that straight path. There's a mate of mine went into a public toilet once. This is a real Ralph story, isn't it? A mate of mine went into a public toilet once. And it was one of them public toilets where, you know, there's the sign of the little man on the door. And he pushed the door. It was a swing door. And as, as he pushed it, he pushed it open quite violently. He was, he was in a hurry, shall we say, to get in. And as he pushed it open, there was a bang. It was a bang. I thought, oh, right. So he went in, and as the door closed, he looked behind the door to see what it had banged up against. And there was this bloke on the floor, sort of sitting there on the floor, clutching his head. Thought, oh, oh, like that. And he goes, you're right, mate. And he went, don't let the door close. And he jumped up to his feet and tried to get his fingers underneath the bottom of the door to stop it from closing. But the spring on the door was too strong and it just... And he went, oh! Don't you realise what's happened, he said. I just came in here hours ago. (laughs) Did what I had to do, washed my hands. Couldn't get back out. There's no handle on this side of the door. It must have fallen off. I can't... He says, I was trying to leave it open with my fingers under the bottom. When you came in, banged my head with it. And my mate, this is a true story, looked at him and said, well, that's the indoor. The outdoor's over there, and it goes the other way. <laughs> oh. You come into life through one door. There ain't no going back through that door. It has closed behind you. You're going out of a different door. You're only going to be in the toilet of life for so long. Hey, see what I'm doing? <laughs> Before you get out the other end. You go up to the outdoor, you try pushing it now, it will not yield. It won't move. And you go, oh, okay. Well, this is where I am for however long. There will come a point, the final moments of your life, you will walk up to that door. You've been aware that it's there. I'm aware that it's there. You know? I mean, let's be honest. If life is a, a game of football, I'm in the second half. I'm open for extra time and penalties. But I'm still in the second half. And that door, as you go through life, gets more and more obvious, doesn't it? You think, I'm going through that one day, but I can't go through it now. It won't open. In the last few moments of your life, you will go to that door. You will push it. It will open really gently. And the light will shine in from the other side. And you go, whoa. But then when you step through, if you go without Jesus, you've got a suitcase of sin with you. And you can't go any further. Because what we know about heaven is, I can only remember this in the King James Version, naught that defileth shall enter, it says. In other words, anything that's going to mess heaven up ain't going to get in. So unless we have turned from the darkness, as Jesus said, and stepped into the light, we can't go any further. In fact, going through that door at the end of this life won't be a wonderful sense of expectation. It will be a terrible fear. And heaven knows, folks, 
I've seen a few people die in my time. And I've seen people die in fear of what's behind that door for them. And I have seen people who know Jesus, for whom that they can't wait to get through it. And when they move towards that door, and sometimes you can see it as they enter the last stage of their life, and they are full of joy, and it's written on their face, because they know they're going home. And they know that the person on the other side of that door, the first person they're going to see is Jesus. And they've been talking to Jesus for years. We've been talking to Jesus, most of us, if not all of us, for years. He's no stranger to us. He knows us and we know him. So let's encourage ourselves about this. and Say, why is there so much evil in the world? Free will make. We can do what we like. And the reason we can do what we like is because if we couldn't do what we like, we'd be controlled like little robots and we wouldn't know what love is. And God wants us to know what love is so that we can love one another and love him and love ourselves, actually. And we need to learn that. But if we continue to live in the darkness, we won't know it properly. Step into the light. Put the darkness behind you. You need to do it every day, don't you? So do I. Because we're tainted by the world. and Bad stuff happens all of the time. We need to just keep on learning about God's word. Keep on putting every aspect of our life before him in prayer. Keep on meeting together so we can encourage one another. And in this way, that door at the other end of life holds no fear. No fear at all. No fear. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the light in the world. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the hope of the world. And Lord, we we can see all the dark things happening in the world. We understand why they happen. Because you've given us that choice. But we pray that we might choose wisely and enable us to pray for one another. To pray for our enemies as well as our friends. To not be judgmental about people who get caught doing things that they know to be wrong and we know to be wrong. Help us not to take delight in shooting people down, knocking people down, discrediting people. But instead to encourage one another more and more and to belong more and more to the light. And Lord Jesus, send your Holy Spirit into every member, every person in this room. That we may be strong in the light and strong in your joy and your strength. In Jesus' name, amen.